Praise God. Good morning. Uh, due to some technical difficulties, which I have been having, experiencing, uh, in regards to uh, the communication uh, between myself and uh, the sister that I had uh, referred to, for some reason or another, uh, my uh, emails are coming back, uh, you know, uh, uh, error and, and, you know, being sent out, whatever, you know. Uh, and then, uh, and because I've got the extra time now, uh, praise God, uh, I'm going to try to do it for everybody, the witness, or at least the testimony part of it, uh, all on one video here, and uh, so I want each one of you to listen to what uh, has taken place in my life, if you choose to anyway, it's completely up to you. Uh, I believe there's some, has been some significant differences in what has taken place in my life, and I've attempted over the years to, to share this with others, and uh, for some reason or another, you know, the Lord's got a, a, a thing that He's working out in my life and uh, in the lives of all of us, and uh, so it just was never received, and I don't know that this will be received any more than it's ever been, and that's okay, because uh, I've been reminded by the Father before on several occasions, and you'll see there's a connection to this as I share this, but that uh, it was by one man's faith, okay, Abraham, that this whole thing began, all right, he was called out from among his countrymen as well. And I, I, I'm speaking in a spiritual sense in regards to the body of Christ. Uh, and uh, i got to tell you, it doesn't surprise me when it comes to God uh, that he would prefer uh, to have one man called out and this little Gideon army established that strikes the match that starts to fire. And so I'm believing by faith that's exactly what's getting ready to take place here in Tucson, uh, and uh, it was out of obedience, uh, more than anything else, I guess, because it, when Abraham received that uh, calling of God, he believed, amen, and uh, that's pretty much how it happened for me, too. Uh, so, I'm going to do it as quickly as possible, don't want to hold you any longer than I have to, but uh, uh, it is a 35-year walk. But it's not filled with every day, okay? You guys know that's not how it works in the Lord. It may be in some cases, you know, it seemed to be that way. And especially here in the end times, uh, I don't know, you know, the Spirit of the Lord is moving. And uh, uh, a lot of you brothers and sisters may be receiving it on a daily basis now. I don't know whatever the Father is doing at this end time to make sure everyone is gathered in and brought to the point of being able to believe by faith uh, each and every step of what's going to take place. But that we know that <laughs> for certain, all right, at least those of us who have matured in the Word, there's no question in my heart and mind that the Father would not just leave us hanging out here if this is the end time, which I believe it is, and we have entered into that last phase okay, of what I believe is the finished work of faith, then something needs to begin to take place on earth, all right? So it just don't happen in the heavenlies. It just don't happen in the spiritual. I mean, it, it comes right down here, right here in our faces in regards to the natural, okay? These are natural events that are getting ready to take place, amen, Jesus? So we need to... As I mentioned in the last video, to be ready to accept these natural events that are getting ready to take place. So I liken it on to uh, Abraham. And uh, if by one man's faith this whole thing began, then who are we to say that it won't end in the same way? By one man's faith. Amen? So here we go. It happened, uh, it began back in 19. Uh, 76, 77. I believe I went out to California. It was called from the East Coast, 1976. But it wasn't until later on in the first part of 77 
that I actually made my confession of faith before a brother. Uh, and at that time, okay, like I had said before, and uh, many of you may or may not have already listened to, that, uh, you know, I, I grew up uh, believing. All right? I'm, hey, uh, that's just the way it was. It was in my heart, and uh, I believed that Jesus was Jesus, and God was God, and that whole story about... Uh, the manger and the shepherds and all that stuff that you know if you, you live in this country you can't help but to get up on a Sunday morning and, and go out and say I mean there's churches almost everywhere so then you had the Christmas stories each year and the Easter stories and so on and so forth so I just you know I, I came up believing so um, anyway there did come a time though because of, uh, of a couple of crying outs, one woman I was about 12, you know. My pa family fought a lot. They're uh, alcoholic and uh, come from a divorced home. And uh, so it really affected me as a kid. And then, But I remember when I was about, I don't know, 12 years old or so, I cried out to God in prayer. And I didn't ask for a new bike or anything else like that. Uh... I was pretty emotionally broken up. Uh, my family separated when I was about three. And there was a lot of going back and forth, more or less. I was with my mom most of the time. and But then when I got older, of course, she had to let us boys, my brother, who's older than I am, and myself, go back to my dad. Well, it was during this period of time, at the, about the age of 12, that uh, I cried out to God. In prayer in prayer because they was arguing and fighting and carrying on in the kitchen and I just ran into my room to get away from it all dishes are being broken tables are being shoved and oh my god you know father god anyway I went in there was crying and called out to god I said father you know I told him lord or whatever a kid would say god jesus whatever <laughs> I remember what I asked for though I asked him to help me to understand why people acted the way they did. You know, I don't know what made me to pray that way, but that's what I asked for. And lo and behold, years later, I, I find out that I prayed for wisdom and didn't know that, but that's what I prayed for. So, uh, now before all that uh, took place, I want to let you know how it really got started for me, how I believe it really got started for me. And of course, I've already shared my witness and testimony in regards to my believing that the Father knows who we are in our mother's wombs. He knows the heart of that child, what he's going to become, what he's going to believe. And I believe it's that hour that we're given, you know, well, at least the Father knows what measure of faith we're going to be able to receive. That's just the way it is. So, <clears throat> that being what it is, I was about seven years old. This is back in 1958 or so. And there was a movie that came out at Christmas time. And it was such a dramatic movie uh, about the crucifixion of Christ that uh, it was banned after it was shown the first time. It was called The Robe. I don't know if any of you are probably around my age that would remember that. But here I am laying down there watching this. This is Christmas time. Just a little kid. And I'm really watching everything, you know, about Jesus healing people and, and the good that he tried to share with others and the love he attempted to give to others. And all of a sudden, don't you know, here they come to get him. They're going to crucify him. They start beating him up and everything else. And, oh, my God, I get up. Now, like I said, it was a, a, a very... Um, for that period of time, it was quite, uh, you know, gruesome, uh, you know. So I went running to my mom. I said, Mom, Mom, why did they do that to him? He never did anything to hurt anybody. All he wanted to do was love people, to help people. I just, I was in tears. So I well, went back and then finished watching what they did, you know. So that stuck with me all my life, you know. I believe that was the circumcision of my heart as a little child. And if you look at the time, it was 7 or 8. Well, you know, it's on the 8th day that uh, 
most Jewish children in the in the natural, uh, they receive a circumcision. Okay. So since we're speaking about spiritual things, it's the circumcision of the heart. So anyway, real quick, we jump back up to 12. Okay, and then that takes place about praying out, crying out to God to help me to understand why people treat each other the way they did. I just wanted to give you a little brief background there, okay? So, and one other thing, uh, but I'm not going to go into that. Okay. It just had to do with an in-body experience at the age, uh, right in that same age, 12 or 13. It was the weirdest thing that ever happened, man. I was, uh, at that time anyway, uh, I was at these, uh, it was just a new school year, and I was at a new school, so there were some things going on, you know. And, uh, but we were learning how to uh, go to different classes, because this was like uh, secondary school just before you go to, high school. And in high school they started doing that, you know, uh, this is way back when. And so, uh, 64 or something like that, you know. Well, let's see, 12, that would have been, uh, I was born in 51, 12, 63. Somewhere around there, 63, 64. So, but I'm, you know, I got the class uh, schedule and everything, and I, I know I've already gone to a couple classes, at least I believe I had, and was already familiar with the school and the changing the classes and things. But I came to school one day, and out of nowhere, it was like, you know, how some people explain an out-of-body experience? Well, I didn't have an out-of-body. I had an in-body experience. It felt like I, was, I had just come into my own self. That was weird. Well, you know, years later, if you think about it, at the age of 12 or 13, look what Jesus did. That was, that was the age, it's also known as the age of accountability uh, in tradition, tr traditional Jewish families. It's the age of accountability. Praise God. But uh, it was also the time that uh, the Lord, amen, entered into the temple. <laughs> So I don't know what connection that might have had with a 12 or 13 year old and I'm taking you on a spiritual journey because I believe the hand of God has been upon my life from my mother's womb. So anyway, uh, an in-body experience. Woo! Next thing I know, I'm standing in that hallway and I can't remember where I'm even at. For a moment, So it was set, it was to the point that I if it wasn't for somebody else, some other student in the hallways, that I could show this uh, class uh, paper to which class I was supposed to be going to, I never would have made it to class. <laughs> Amen. That's how it was. So it was pretty weird. Anyway, let's go on. I want to make this as quick as possible. I keep it as short as possible. But this is the same testimony I've given. Okay, from the first videos right on through. Just trying to condense it now into one video and hope and pray by God that you'll sit down and listen to it. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, during my lifetime as a kid, uh, there's been a, a, a couple of uh, times that uh, I've had some near death uh, once as a child in a swimming pool. <coughs> when uh, I had dove down into this pool, uh, there were some kids playing uh, water basketball, bigger kids. And uh, I jumped down into that water because, you know, I'm one of them that is afraid to open his eyes, you know. <laughs> but I'm swimming underwater and I got my eyes closed. Somehow or another, I got myself positioned up underneath a group of them who were above me, and I'm in the water, you know, and I'm trying to come up, and as I come up, all I can do is hit these bodies. I, I can't get up, I can't get up, and I'm running out of air. And somehow or another, by the grace of God, one of them kids, uh, they're bigger kids, like I said, picked me up and brought me up out of the water, and I must have passed out. That's how close it was that, uh, you know, I ended up losing consciousness over the thing. So, amen, okay? 
this was going to happen again later in my life after I came back from Vietnam, but uh, it wasn't because of, uh, well, it began with my wanting to die, you know, and then the Lord showed me that I really didn't want to die, <laughs> okay, so he got that out of my head real quick. Anyway, uh, that was pretty much it as a kid. So, um, oh yeah, one other was really neat too. I'm mentioning these things because I believe they all have to do with a work in the will of Father in my life. And uh, when I was about at the same age, seven or eight, I went out to this garage to do at our house, amen? And like any other kid, I'm just looking around in that garage, you know, getting mischief, you know. And somehow or another, I got me a book of matches. Uh, and it's interesting that the same wooden box of matches okay, should happen to come up later in my life, which I'll explain in a painting, and I've mentioned that a, a few times about striking the match that starts the fire. So anyway, praise God, uh, as a kid, I'm out there in that garage, and I see this old can, it's got a spout on it, okay, and you guys, some of you know where I'm headed at right now before I even go any further, but this is honest to God truth, I would, I have a reason to lie to any of you guys about nothing. Uh, anyway, I go over to this can, and like any knucklehead, <laughs> kid, boy, uh, seven, eight years old, I want to see what's inside that can. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, my God. Uh, so what do I do? I strike one of the matches, and I put it down inside that can, and nothing happened. And I'm standing right like this looking at it at that spot. And I don't see anything. So I do it one more time. This is the second match, amen? The witness. Second match. Strike that match. This time it don't go out. Boom! <laughs> that flame comes. It's just a little bit of gas in the bottom of that tank. And whoosh! It hits my face, burns my eyebrows off, eye my eyelashes. Takes all the air out of my lungs because it's right in my face. <gasps> I go running into the house and they call the rescue squad and everything else takes place. Amen. And uh, that was just, that was something. Anyway, just wanted to share that because it's interesting how all these things kind of more or less line themselves up with the rest of the story. Amen. Page two of the Paul Harvey report. Amen. And some of you may not be old enough to understand. Remember Paul Harvey, but he had page two. <laughs> the other half of the story, amen. So anyway, uh, there you go. That's the basics for the childhood thing. And uh, the next step is uh, I'm getting shipped off to Vietnam. Ooh. Now I think it's all good and great and wonderful, you know, because my, my brother's in the service already. He's, you know, like I said, he's my older brother by about five years. My sister's about uh, three and a half, four years, someplace wrong in there. She was born right after him, you know, and then I came along like three years later, whatever. The third of uh, three, okay. Anyway, um, off to Vietnam. Now, I'm, like I said, I'm feeling all cool and slick and everything else because I got me this uniform, okay? I'm a soldier, you know, thinking I'm all that in a bag of chips. But truth of fact is, I'm just a 17-year-old kid. I ain't got the foggiest idea of what I'm doing. I have no political, I have, you know, I quit school when I was 14. And, you know, society and everything else that had anything to do with really maybe knowing a little bit what was going on. I was a knucklehead. I didn't know nothing. <laughs> I just wanted the uniform. Well... You get to Vietnam all of a sudden, though, you know, after you turn 18, well, within 30 days, right after that, I mean, I had 30 day, uh, exactly to the day, I mean, I, I uh, got my uh, orders on the 14th of November, 1969, got a 30 day leave, uh, and was shipped overseas 30 days later, you know, well, I think it took like about uh, maybe a week to 10 days for shipping and everything else to get us all lined up with our gear, and then, shoot, you know, there I went. I show up in Vietnam getting off this plane, and uh, 
Wow, talking about reality. The doors open up and we start to step out and you can feel this wave of heat because it's tropical heat over there, you know. And, uh, of course, this is uh, in the winter months, so it probably wasn't as hot as it ended up getting. But, uh, anyway, first thing I see when I walk off the, out of that door to go down the steps, I see over on the left what looks to me like a, bo a bunch of body bags. It turned out to probably be just garbage bags, but that ain't what I saw. I'm seeing body bags, a stack of them, okay? And that's what I'm seeing when I get off this plane. So all of a sudden, having that uniform, <laughs> it ain't as slick and cool as it was before. Now we're getting it in, you know, to the real thing. Well, by the grace of God, I got out of that with my life, amen, Jesus, and many did not. So, back home now. Well, you know what? My particular generation saw a lot of different things take place. And as children, I believe it really affected a lot of us. Some of that was Kennedy's assassination. I was sitting down watching TV as a child at school when that took place. I was actually watching the arcade, me and a group of other kids, when he got shot. I mean, that, that stuff sticks with you. We were all sent home, and uh, we knew before anybody else the president had been shot. So, you know, then Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King and all the upheaval and finding out that there's people in this country that wasn't even allowed to vote. Here, I'm being taught up north here, apple pie, Chevrolet, and uh, America, rah, rah. Well, guess what? It ain't like that. And after I got done with Vietnam, I really knew it ain't like that. And then, you know, plastic Yono and uh, this whole thing about, uh, and we're still dealing with it, okay? We've got these guys with the money and stuff like that. Well, we were having that same deal. We, we figured it was all a plastic society because that was, you know, what it was all leading up to. It was nothing real. And we couldn't trust the government and so on and so forth. Okay? No different than it is now. Goes to show how fast we evolve as people. Not very fast. Anyway, uh, I was a little disappointed as a young man. And a little depressed, to say the least. So you throw in a little bit of booze and all of a sudden... You don't know what might happen. I was a partier. There's God. Hey, it was the <laughs> early 70s, man. Everybody was partying. I don't know anybody that wasn't. Everybody was smoking. It was all part of life. I started smoking when I was 11 years old. By the time I was 13, I was hooked on the nicotine. So anyway, uh... I guess I'm about 22, 23 years old when I come back. I maybe have four years. I mean, about 21, 22. Uh, I'm sitting at this bench pad. Uh, big major city, or, or not major city, my, my home in Toledo. It's a good size city, but a major intersection. Seacorn Monroe. For any of you that may be from Toledo, Ohio, when you hear this, you don't know where I'm talking about. Anyway, just a little bit off the corner. I get off. I'm sitting there. While I'm sitting there at the bus stop, I'm really depressed. And I'm talking to God and telling him that, oh, man, maybe I'm just talking to myself. I don't know. But I just don't want to live no more because, it, you know, it's the same stuff all over again. All right? It's just nothing good. Nothing good at all in my life. So I got up off that bus stop and started walking down the street. And uh, just as they get past to a point where there's this brick building, and it's a pretty good-sized brick building, I'm just about halfway into the center of that brick building where there's really, you know, if you needed to move real quick, you couldn't get out of the way of nothing, and that brick building would be right behind you. That's exactly when I start hearing all these lights and sirens coming from down the street. I mean, they're, they're just uh, running, they're just flying down. And I can see that in the distance. 
This is nighttime, eh, you know, 10, 12 o'clock, who knows. And uh, I can see it's coming closer and closer and closer. Next thing I know, there I am as I'm watching this. Here comes this pickup truck coming, whoa, way over one way, and then coming back in this way because he's dodging in and out of the traffic and the cars, whatever little few cars that were out there. And the law's right behind him. Well, wouldn't you know it, he goes to the high side right there at the intersection and then swerves back to the, uh, turns to the right to come back. And just at that angle, he's got to be going 60 miles an hour, folks. If he's going a mile an hour, he's going 60. And he is coming right at me at a direct angle. And I'm standing right there with nothing but a concrete wall behind me. I've got no place to go. And I'm like a frozen deer looking at them lights. <coughs> and this guy, I'm telling you, before the father, that vehicle got so close to me that I could literally see inside the windshield, the dash. I know exactly what he was wearing. A pair of those bib overhaul jeans and a white t-shirt. Now my eyes was particular. Now sitting next to him was a young girl. But my eyes was particularly on him because he's the one driving. And all of a sudden, just as, out of nowhere, boom, this great, like a white light. Now you guys know a difference between the color of the hues of street lights and, and candlelight out of a vehicle. This was not that kind of light. This was a bright white light. And I, before the Father to this day, still believe I saw trails in that light as if it was an angel. Bam! And I'm telling you, there was no place else he could have gone. But for some reason or another, when he hit that curb, it spun him right out back out, away from me. I fell back against the wall, just out of breath, man. I just slided, slid right down that wall, man. I was scared to death, buddy. And I started to cry a little bit, and I ended up, I'm in like a daze, dude walk around the back of the building and go right down to my knees and give thanks to God. I'm still alive. All of a sudden, I don't want to die as much as I thought I wanted to die. Amen. So God got that out of me real quick. Real quick. <coughs> so, next thing I know, a couple years pass by. I'm still out there drinking and partying like everybody else is. But, because uh, one day I come home after drinking in the evening and I go to my apartment and I'm pretty depressed because I'm not having much luck with the gals either. <laughs> I just wasn't having much luck. Period. From childhood right on up. Although, uh, you know, some would say, man, you've been blessed, boy. Saved from drowning, got out of Vietnam, and, you know, wanted to take your own life and the Lord changed your mind there. But I'm not looking at any of that. Okay, we don't see that. All we say is, see is the boo-hoo, poor old me. That's what we see, and that's what I was saying. So once again, it's come to a point in my life where I'm crying out to the Father, because I'm just upset, man. Again, okay, now I'm 26, 27, 25, 26, something like that, in that period of time. I get up, and I go outside, and it just happens to be raining down, and I'm going to yell at the top of my lungs to make sure I get God's attention this time because evidently the first prayer as a 12 year old didn't have much effect and i don't you know it the very same thing now I didn't remember this until years later but the very same thing I had asked the father for when I was 12 I'm screaming out at the top of my lungs Lord I need to know why people treat each other the way they do I just couldn't take it no more. I had to know. Well, I didn't know that. that was That was the Father calling me. I ended up going out west, like the lightning is from the east to the west. Amen. Went out there. And I was with this gal for the first six months out there, and the Holy Spirit wouldn't come into my life then. And, and most of you who understand, that we weren't married so at that time. But as things worked out, 
when the father was ready to move upon me, the relationship ended and I was by myself. And that's when I ran into this young man after I went a couple of uh, Sundays. Couldn't get into the church because it's never been my uh, occasion to, uh, to actually enter in and be a part of a, a fellowship. And I'll, that's all part of my story. But anyway, uh, here we are. Okay, praise God. Uh, I've made my confession of faith. And I'm thinking, well, is that it? You know, I, I don't know. I guess I'm expecting uh, the walls to crack or something to take place. He says, yeah, that's it. I said, oh, okay. Now, I'd always believed in God and Jesus. So I thought to myself before I entered into this confession of faith before him, well, you know, I even talked to the Lord. <laughs> I said, well, God, you know, I believe. So what's the difference between my believing and telling somebody else and, and saying it out in the open? Up until then, I never had to. I'd never made a confession from my heart, out of my lips, in front of anybody else. This time I had. So I confessed it. Okay? It was at that time. All right? Now what happened three days later is the single most important thing that ever took place in my entire life and is the foundation and the basis of all my faith in regards to the Word of God, Jesus Christ, and God the Father, and the Kingdom of Heaven. All in one nutshell. Just like that. Now on the morning of the third day, and I'm going to tell you this is exactly what took place. For two nights in a row, I would read the little Bible there that I had and didn't do that much reading. How much reading can you do in two nights? Because I'd never read it before. But I wanted to know, you know, what was up. So I started reading. Sure enough, boy, that conviction in the heart, you know. Especially with Paul, he had a ministry to us. He knew exactly, the Father knows exactly who and what man is, what we are. It's, it's us that needs to find out the truth about that, because he already knows. So, I was being convicted, and I was crying. Some of you I've shared with before, I realized that, you know, all these years that you know, I'd been asking, I wanted to know and understand why people treated each other the way they did. I was finding out. I was finding out. So for two nights there, you know, I would fall asleep with the Bible in the bed with me, in tears, and the next day I'd get up. It was just the morning of the third day. I get in this shower, and as the water's coming down on me, it's got a little glass door and a little window, okay, in this shower. And uh, I'm standing there, and the water's coming down on me. As that water is coming down on me, the Holy Spirit came upon me. And what took place was a vision. And I'm sitting there. And this all happens in just a, a second. But I sense that that water that is coming down on me, it ain't coming down on me on the outside no more. It is literally washing right through me. Cleansing, washing, regeneration of the soul. Sins being removed. I was getting worse spiritually, inside out. And at that same moment, in that window, I saw this dove come in. And he went behind me. And just as all of this began, it ended. Whoa! Whoa! What just happened here? I reached down and turned this water off. And I open up the shower door to get out. And as soon as I start to step up, brothers and sisters, I am as light as a feather. If a wind would have come along, it would have blown me away. That's how light. I felt like I could float. And when I set my feet down on the shower floor, well, first one foot and then the other, I could sense inside myself that Beneath my feet, under that floor, was a great big old huge rock. And that no matter where I moved from one place to the other, that rock followed me, no matter where I went. Now, I don't know how many of you, on the third day of your confession of faith, had that happen to you. But in 35 years, I ain't met one. 
And I've said this story many times. As a matter of fact, most people, they don't act, they act like there's nothing to that. Oh well. Oh well? You people must have lost your mind someplace. Oh well? Oh well? Oh well? Huh. It ain't oh well to me. That began something in me that from then on, uh, it, you can only imagine. If that's how you come into your birth by faith, what po could possibly come f beyond that? Well, I mean, anything could come. That's how I've been walking. Every day of my life, almost anything could happen. Anything. And I mean that quite literally. That was the walk I was set on. And that's when I started studying the Word. A few days, weeks, months. I mean, out of the blue, my brother-in-law comes in from town. Yeah, right, out of the blue. <laughs> A few coincidence people. Yeah, right. Here it is. I'm getting down to the last few weeks or last week or so of my rent. And I'm not working at the time. And here comes my brother-in-law. He's a haul, long-haul driver for a moving company. And he just happens to call. You know, yeah, right, just happened. Amen? And they say, you know, I got a job. I'm right back to Toledo, Ohio, and, and money in my pocket. Just like that. Because I want to tell you something. This is interesting, too, because it relates itself again to Israel. I was made jealous by another nation when I was out there. They're called the Hare Krishna people. And up until that time, all I ever did was believe in Jesus. I didn't do nothing else. I didn't study His Word. I wasn't seeking after Him to live a, a godly life. I wasn't doing any of that stuff. But I hear I come across these Hare Krishna people. I used to call them Hare Krishna. Hare, you know, instead of Hare. Hare Krishna. Anyway, they're out in California. All right, and in the particular area I'm at, I'm out at Newport Beach, uh, Orange County, and actually it was Pastor uh, Chuck Smith, his ministry way back when he got started there in Orange County. Uh, I never really got to come in among them, but it was during the movement of the Holy Spirit at the beginning of his ministry that, Amen, Jesus. I came and made my confession of faith. It was one of those brothers that had left that church who came to my home with me, picked me up on the way home. And we prayed the prayer of faith. And I made my confession of faith. But anyway, before that took place, I'm seeing these Harry Krishna people. Now these people are walking around with dresses on. These are men. Not just the women. The guys dress like with, with dresses on. And they let their hair be cut all back. And all they have is a little ponytail. A spirit, apparently the spirits can come by and snatch their souls up out of their bodies by this ponytail. But nonetheless... Okay? you got to give these guys credit because look at me. I'm comparing it to me at that time. They are devoted. They are so devoted to this rock. Okay? And uh, Buddha, or whatever they called him. And uh, they're going out, passing out flowers to collect donations. When I saw that, you know what it hit me? It hit me like, you know, I wasn't judgmental about what they did. What I saw was what I wasn't doing. That's what I saw. What I saw was, look at what these people were willing to do for a rock. And it convicted me of my heart. And this is before I made my confession of faith. I had to ask myself, what had I ever done? And I believed in the one and only true God. And here these folks are out there doing it for this rock. It really hit me. So I was, as Israel shall be made jealous of a foolish nation. And there's going to be a lot of that. That's the whole issue of what it is that I'm sharing with you, that you can see the journey of Israel in my life, the church. So, that period of time passes. I get back home. Now, First week I'm there, boy, I'm being blessed pretty good, man. A friend of mine lets me have a, a vehicle. I was supposed to, I still owe him 300 bucks for that thing. I never did get it to him. God, Father, forgive me. And if I ever get, you know, I, I just pray the, the Lord forgive me for that debt because he was a good friend. Uh, Bill Lance, 
I'm going to give him credit right out on top in case he happened to hear this video someday. I still owe you that 300 bucks, Bill. But this is back in, uh, anyway, it was a nice little Volkswagen van. And, you know, I had transportation. I was staying at my brother's. And uh, the next thing, you know, uh, but it's only a week or two after I've come back from town. And I'm studying the Word. You know, I'm reading it. Well, I'm just garbage. Gar oh, eating all I can you know, read all I can read. I had a real hunger for that Word. Because uh, of the baptism. I couldn't get enough of that Word. Anyway, uh, it hits me, you know. I'm thinking to myself, well, did that really happen out there in California? And I've shared it with a couple of people. Uh, I got one pastor so stirred up as he was giving me a ride. He wanted to know what the name of the church was. And I'm thinking to myself, what do you mean? I don't know what he's talking about, what the name of the church is. Now, until later, years later, okay, another coincidence, okay, here when I first come into the faith, I got this pastor, Spirit-filled, who evidently, as I'm speaking, okay, the Spirit's moving on him, and he's so excited, he wants to know, what, what, what's the name? I didn't know what he was talking about. But here, years later, Messiah's second assembly. I mean, you guys can look at this stuff as it being coincidence until you're blue in your face. And I'm telling you, I live by faith. These are not coincidences. These are manifestations of the Father in my life. Right from the time I've been born again. Non-stop. So anyway, I'm saying to myself this one morning as I'm getting up and I'm getting ready to get in the truck and take off, I'm just thinking, you know, like anybody would. I'm questioning whether or not, you know, maybe I just had some kind of a mental breakdown or something out there in California. I know I wasn't doing no drugs. I was uh, as clean and as sober as I had ever been because uh, that a Harry Krishna thing, I thought about cleaning up my body. You know, they're real heavy on the temple thing. And uh, uh, wasn't eating no meats and wasn't killing nothing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, I, I went out to California to find Mother Earth. I figured that would be the answer. But the Lord knew that what I would find was Him. So, uh, anyway, I still, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, like I said, it's only a couple of weeks later. Uh, so I'm wondering in my mind as I drive off on the vehicle, Lord, was, was that really you out there in California? Well, get down to the end of the street and I'll make a right-hand turn. And then I no more make that right-hand turn into a, what is like a four-lane road uh, uh, highway, small uh, highway going into town because my brother lived a little bit out of town. I no more get on that road and I'm heading down that road and all of a sudden I look off to the right. Now remember, I am asking God, was this really him in California? Before the Father again, I tell you the truth. I look to the right, and there's this great big billboard standing there. You are never going to believe in a million years what's written on this billboard. It's a sugar company based out there in my brother's area at that time where he was living. The name on that board was I Am. It was the I Am Sugar Company. A great big billboard with the words I Am. I never asked God again about whether or not it was Him. <laughs> I can tell you that. Great big billboard with I A M on. I am. It was Him. It always has been Him. And I never asked Him again if it was. Never did. How about you? <laughs> I don't think so. So praise God. Uh, from that point on, it's pretty much uh, maturing in the Word. The first three years, and I'll tell you again, and I've told others before, and I've mentioned in my videos, I was discipled by Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking I was discipled by the leading of the Holy Spirit as I studied the Word of God. I am telling you I was discipled by Jesus Christ Himself. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. <laughs> How did that come to be? Because when I read the Word, and it said to me that I had no need that a man teach me, that he would teach me. I believed it. 
And I didn't just believe that what it was saying was it had to do something with the Holy Spirit lead me and guide me in the Word of God. No, sir. No, ma'am. I believed it literally that Jesus himself would teach me. And by faith, that's exactly who has taught me. Jesus himself. So, somewhere along the line during these faith ministries, and this is all within the first year or so, because if anybody has really studied the Word, there's a year uh, where the husband and the wife come together, and, they're not, and you're, you don't go out to battle or anything else. You read about that. How when I, I, uh, 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 a husband and a wife in the Jewish tradition, when they're first married, I think it's even in the Old Testament, there's a year that they consummate their marriage. And that took place for me. Along with that, in that period of time, Hag, uh, Haggai, Haggai, and all kinds of different faith uh, believers, Copeland back in that day when they were young, before they got off into this prosperity stuff. Father, forgive them. But that's a, such a mess. A lie. The God of mammon. And you don't know that, man, you just, you're just, you, you need to check it out, because that's all that is. Anyway, Seville, different faith believing, pastors, uh, or ministers, evangelists were going on. So I caught the bug somewhere along the line. I'm sitting there watching them one day, listening to some tapes. Bam, it's like a light went off. I don't know exactly what took place at that moment, but what I was doing on now what would be seem like a well just a, a marriage period of time taking it easy not really putting on the armor or the word of God I was kind of more or less studying but not like it happened after that when that light went on of that faith okay of faith I could not get enough of the word of God I literally ate that word day in and day out. And I was out of work for a while, too, for quite a while. For about three years, this went on, and I couldn't, you know. Again, these are all seemingly like they're coincidences, but I'm walking by faith. For three years, okay, I'm studying that word day in and day out, night in and night out. Can I get enough of it? One day I woke up, and I'm drinking some coffee, and the Bible is sitting over there on the shelf, Okay, in my living room, where I left it the night before, or day before, and I was sitting there drinking some coffee, and I'm looking at this Bible, and I know I just woke up, and you guys can throw this off to a lot of different things, but I will tell you, that Bible went moving like this. It was breathing. Before the Father in Heaven, I tell you, that Bible was moving up and down, up and down. I even rubbed my eyes to make sure that what I was seeing was not an hallucination or I was a, it was moving up and down. Up and down. It was breathing, folks. That's when it hit me that the Word of God in that Bible that you read, it is literally alive. It is alive. And I know you don't think it is, but it is. It literally has a life of its own. So I begin to mature and grow, and I quickly outgrow most of the Pentecostal and full gospel people around me because, you know, I'm watching them go through this laying hands on and slaying people and everything else. It's not that I don't believe in the gifts. It's just the show of it that I don't think is quite right. Something not right about this show. Okay? So I stay my part, my distance. Believing by faith, receive gift of tongues. By the grace and the glory of the God, uh, God the Father, I receive the gift of tongues. And without interpretation, you're not supposed to speak. So I just gave you the interpretation in case there's any uh, people out there that uh, want to say, Well, you ain't allowed to speak in tongues. But I can. Because I can interpret my tongue. It was part of the gift that was given to me, the interpretation. Because the tongues that was given to me, I'm going to probably do this in another uh, 
tape because I don't want to hold you too long and I know an hour is pretty long for anybody to listen to even some old man babbling that's what it all seems like to you guys I'm sure but uh, I'm gonna finish it up in another video and uh, give you guys a break we're at uh, pretty much the beginning of my uh, maturing in the spirit and growing outgrowing my fellow uh, brethren around me because of the depth of the knowledge of the understanding of being given to me it didn't take long. Within the first couple of years, I needed to find a more matured ministry. I needed to find someone who was not acting so foolish with the gifts. Someone who had grown beyond that and was getting into the depths of the Word of God where I was being led because I was getting led into areas about Noah and the ark and the three different levels of that ark and the window, spirit, soul, body, different areas that most of my other brethren, okay, and this is in the first couple couple years of my walk, my study of the Word of God, that uh, they're just not even into. I mean, most of them are understanding uh, partially in the Melchizedek priesthood and things that are along that line, uh, but even they are really among the ones who are studying the hardest and, and really making an effort to know they're the ones getting into the idea of the Melchizedek priesthood. But uh, that wasn't where I stopped at. That's not where the Father would have me to stop. So I continued to grow. And so I'm going to pick this back up again. And if you're interested, come on back in. If you're not, it doesn't matter. Because this witness, this testimony, is to the world. All right? Not just you. And to any and all who might come across it. So it's got a date. It's got a period of time. And nobody can't say that God didn't do exactly what he said he was going to do. Amen? What we got wrong is the idea that we think that the whole world, okay, because everybody is watching these witnesses. Well, brother, I've told you before, these witnesses are the body, spiritual body of Christ and the natural, uh, and natural Israel. These are the two witnesses. Now, you'll figure that out later on. And, uh, well, I hope it ain't too late. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> For you that are faithful, it won't be. The Holy Spirit's going to convict you of the truth of what's being said. And when you get a hold of it, you'll understand and know exactly what it is it's God doing. Okay? Through one man's faith it began. Through one man's faith it ends. That's just the way it is. And Gideon's army, you know, you know how God is. The Father loves taking a little group of people and turning the world upside down. That's exactly how he is. So I have no problem with Gideon's little army getting established right here in Tucson, Arizona. I have no problem with one man's faith, by faith, allowing that the Father would allow it to take place, that the match gets struck. I have no problem with any of that. And most of you who are spirit-filled and matured shouldn't have any problem with it at all, either. Actually, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? It's just like the Father would do. Amen? So... I love you for sticking in there for as long as you did, and uh, I've got a, probably another hour of video, and that'll be it. And uh, I will help share everything up to today, and who, why, where, what, when that I am. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. See you guys later. If I can get this arrow over here. <laughs>